they have a lot to say, but you may have questions. Yes, please, our keynote speaker. Yes, I, I heard you mention reference to Alinsky. Uh, how has Alinsky and his model influenced your organizing, and how have you moved beyond Alinsky in terms of how you organize, particularly coming out of Chi-Town? Okay, all right. Uh, that's a very good question. When I started, when I first started organizing, this was back in 1985, it was organized around a sort of like a, a Alinsky model. All right, you knock on doors, you create an organizing committee, you develop these issues. You don't have any sort of issues that, you know, what uh, are controversial or anything like that. Okay, what I, what I, even early on, sort of based on my influences from my parents and my, like, uh, my grandparents, that, you know what, there's a much larger sort of sense that we need to, a much larger sort of like uh, identity that we need to have. And it goes beyond that sort of simple organizing, all right? And I immediately sort of like, you know, threw that away. And it really started addressing many of the real issues and moving away from the model of like uh, uh, Alinsky. I do think in terms of it's like core, it's very important in terms of learning how to organize. But, you know what, what about this, you know, the philosophy? And you know what, what about the ideology? That has to be included in the organizing uh, uh, as well. Because you don't, you're not organizing in a vacuum, okay? These issues exist. Uh, because of oppression, these issues exist because of capitalism itself, and we need to identify that uh, that enemy and organize like against that enemy. Over the years, I sort of developed even more in terms of you know this is the internationalist sort of perspective that we have to address the issues of race, we have to address the issues of class. When I was with the uh, the union, the BCGM, they did not want to have that discussion whatsoever and try to avoid that sort of discussion. And I can understand in terms of, you know what, how this, how this could look. But I believe personally that we have to have those uh, discussions and we have to be organizing. So I've moved beyond that sort of initial sort of or, uh, Alinsky sort of organizing and try to develop a much more internationalist point of view in terms of what really needs to happen and incorporate race and class in anything that I do. Please. Question for, for uh, Trip. Trip, uh, had the experience of uh, the, the medical marijuana bill that went to the, uh, the, the state of Rhode Island mm -hmm. was shepherded through by Representative Tom Salega, who I did pretty good, he was very involved, he was a really good guy. And we used to have this discussion, uh, full disclosure, I was a kid get before I three years, so I kind of know what it takes to put a good guy and we go. I had, a, I had a half a dozen clients that, you know, that uh, basically I grew up with. Very work intensive, know what the bills can be. The question I have for you is, you know, well, first off, when we started, when he started this in the early conversations, one of the things we used to talk about is that this was going to be an, uh, a means of economics for minorities. Mm -hmm. That minorities would be the first, not the last or the second thought, to move into these areas. As, and I don't want to use the term reparations because that almost sounds insulting. But in a way, the, 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 they could have an economic, uh, you know, entrance into a, into a business mm -hmm. that was understood by the people, though in some cases serving time. What I'm getting at is your barriers in terms of economics, the fees, the red tape that they're putting in front of you. Can you speak to some of that? Because you know, you said I ate. You, know, you can you maybe have access to two, but just to reach that two, we'll take the economic barriers are they putting uh, up against you so that you can't reach your goal, your goal, your dream of, it, uh, of being an entrepreneur in this area. I'm glad you asked that question. And um, kind of the, the economic barriers haven't presented themselves quite well yet because the Cannabis Control Commission still has yet to define some of those provisions for getting a recreational dispensary license. But um, I would say that we've seen more of those barriers in terms of actually getting that bill passed. Um, a lot of bills that have legalized weed, like especially the one in Massachusetts I hear, did not have too many provisions about providing social equity and worker cooperative 
business licenses and wow those are only two of every single zone so just again six zones 24 licenses four um licenses per zone one for social equity one for worker cooperative um in terms of having those those are actually like some of the most robust social equity and worker cooperative kind of designated licenses we've seen in the entire country so um i would say that those economic barriers you're talking about are gonna fall on the commission like the commission is going to be the people that decide how hard it's going to be for those like us who would like to apply for a social equity or a worker cooperative license to get that license a go ahead okay. there's an application fee is there not there is going to be an application okay. fee yes i've seen it up to a hundred thousand mm -hmm. it could be that high okay how does a minority okay you want with limited access unless they go to some angel investor who's pr probably going to be a white person mm -hmm. how do you get that thing to interest or assistance to get into an area that they promised was going to be something that would provide our community well, what we're hoping that um, would help with the cost of applying for a license is we're hoping that within the bill, they're going to specifically put a section where existing marijuana businesses will have to provide money towards licensing fees for social equity and work cooperative applicants. We're hoping to get that specifically in the bill. And um, another big thing is just fundraising um we have been looking at potentially finding angel investors but we've also been looking at doing fundraising through platforms like patreon in order to just passively make income in order to put um up for that licensing fee but yeah to be completely honest a lot of it is still up in the air and a lot of it is important to talk about right now um when i mentioned those listening sessions earlier that's where a lot of these ideas can be brought up. But um, right now, the fight is making sure that there are, as you said, easy ways for minorities to be able to plug into this industry. And um, yeah, that's what the fight is about. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yes. I mean, for trip, I know it's kind of early, but is there any mechanism in your organization that will be able to measure some of the impact of the program, say on the inequities that we heard this morning, and whether or not it is having an impact on some of the criminal justice outcome, whether or not it's reducing recidivism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while we don't have any specific ways to gather data right now, um, there is an organization in Rhode Island called Rhode Island Cannabis Justice Coalition. And what this coalition aims to do is to support all these upcoming worker cooperatives that are popping up in Rhode Island. And hopefully some of the work that they will do will be that data analysis and data collection of these new social equity and worker cooperative businesses so we can have specific data to compare to before these licenses existed. Um, these are all things that I definitely want to be involved with the coalition, but um, as I said earlier, a lot of this is still up in the air, but that is a great point, so thank you. More questions? Well, I get to <laughs> There's somebody there that hasn't asked yet. Dan? Yeah. For me, um, yeah. um, I'm older than, than you, I don't know the name of the fellow in the middle of the night. I'll see. Okay. Well, one of the things is when I was thinking about sort of like, you know, doing this, all right, and uh, really sort of exploring, okay, how do we bring sort of philosophical sort of like uh, uh, teachings in sort of community organizing itself, all right? And I was always fascinated by Camus, 
So as I read more of Sisyphus, it was like, okay, you know, it rang in my head that this is, this is about resistance and resilience, right? This is not about uh, punishment. And so how do you translate that into songs of organizing as well? And so I used to have folks have read sort of excerpts from sort of Sisyphus and sort of discuss, okay, what are we talking about here? And I would lead them to a conversation around sort of resistance and perseverance and come back to the issue that we're organizing on and say that we have to be what Sisyphus was. We have to resist, we have to persevere. Right? The way to resist and persevere is to organize, develop strategies and tactics, and you know, modify those strategies and tactics itself. itself. We cannot sort of like you know, pigeonhole ourselves and this is the only way to organize. Right? And that's one of the things that's through my career, I've really tried to sort of have this sort of much, much larger analysis of what needs to uh, happen. And, you know, I work with people who also see that, you know, we have to have a much more deeper analysis. And sometimes with writings, uh, it, it sort of helps people sort of visualize, okay, this, this is what we're doing. Because when I first introduced it, people are like, what the hell are you talking about, okay? And who is this Camus guy? And they, they didn't even say his name correctly, okay? But through sort of like perseverance, they, they began to understand and why I was having them read this and talking about the issues of resilience, the issue of perseverance uh, itself. That this was not a punishment, this was someone who is resisting those who have oppressed it. And we have to do the exact sort of same thing. Okay? And you know, using sort of like uh, folks like uh, James Baldwin as well, you know, and talking about sort of the interconnectedness of our communities. All right, that we need to be sort of a part of our community. And that's the entire sort of community. It's not just this person's community or that person's community. So it, it, it helped to have these sort of larger issues around race, around uh, uh, class, using sort of like, you know, these authors that some folks were familiar with and some folks weren't. But we engaged in, all right, this is how we can make some sort of change. And you know what, read up on who know who these individuals are. Okay, so I'm, I'm very big in terms of, you know, what having sort of these like philosophical underpinnings when we talk about organizing itself, because a lot of times we get away from like uh, that. We want to talk about the nuts and bolts of that cycle organizing. But if you're going to be in it for the long haul, like I am, you have to expand not only your like uh, skill base, but you know what, also your thinking of how to do this work and do this work effectively and what works somewhere doesn't work somewhere else, okay? How as an organizer can, wherever you go, you un once you understand the issues, once you've organized people, you know what to exactly do, okay? And I think that's, that's sort of like really important. And sometimes missing in the trainings that organizers do today is A, B, C, D, okay? And you know what, uh, I think that we need much more of that, uh, more than just that. Uh, they don't understand that not only just the basic of organizing sort of itself, but what are the real sort of philosophical underpinnings of organizing and where, where can it actually go and what should it actually be? And I think expanding sort of our horizons is very important because, you know, the, when, I, when I started, I started off in like uh, June 10th, 1985 as an organizer. My first issue was a stop sign. Uh, near a like uh, uh, elementary school, okay? That was like a big issue, right? Bam, we got the media out, we got the stop sign, everything was fine. I went back to that neighborhood 10 years after that, and you know what, the issues were far more complicated, okay? They were dealing with the, like, uh, the issues of drugs, they were dealing with the issues of like uh, abandoned uh, houses. 10 years, totally different. So the strategies and tactics we may have used during this stop sign do not are, are uh, applicable to what's happening with these other larger issues. And we need to change our sort of strategies and tactics to reflect that, okay? We cannot always visit the tactics of the past, all right? All, what we need to do is understand the, uh, those tactics, but tactics change, people change, the people themselves are far more complicated than they were when I, when I started organizing in 1985, okay? And as an organizer, we, are, we must understand that complexity and be willing to sort of, you know, develop 
far more like uh, specific strategies and tactics that are really address those like uh, issues and not be afraid of race and class, which some organizers are. You don't want to have, we don't want to talk about that. Okay. Uh, and these issues are very important because we, it's us against global capital. Okay. And it's, they have all the power and they split it, they split us apart. Okay. And unless, once we have strategies that brings us all like uh, together, we'll still be sort of like, you know, uh, circling around trying to get what crumbs we can from uh, the system, rather than coming together and tackling the system as one. Thank you. Before uh, the panel goes, while we go into the last couple of questions, if you have anything upstairs, um, uh, unfortunately, you know, if you can go get it, um, because we're, they're flipping it for the, uh, the dinner. So my apologies, but uh, we have time for a couple more questions here. But um, please, if you do have anything upstairs, to just uh, go up and uh, gather. Also, if you um, are here from a class, make sure you sign in so we can keep a record and give it to your uh, teachers. So, do you want to ask your second question? I'll defer to somebody else if they want to All right. Oh, wait, yeah. Eric. Uh, hey, everybody. Well, Thank thanks you. so much for being here and Elsie and Trip and Lafia and, and everybody. Uh, I, had a, I had a question about worker owned cooperatives. Uh, I know there's some people in the room that know a lot about those more than me. Uh, but, Trip, you mentioned that. You know, since 20, maybe, in the 2022, community flowers have been trying to get up and running. And it's been a big sacrifice for a lot of people. So I'm wondering what your own cooperatives are. It's my understanding, you know, businesses where the worker owners share the, will share the benefits. Um, to some degree, too, I think they probably share the risks, you know, and the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So how are you, I'm wondering how you're thinking about the fact that a, a small group you know, has put in a lot of work and a lot of time um, over the last year, couple of years. Um, what are new folks going to be expected to do? Um, is it possible that having a, a small group that's not put in the founding work um, and the kind of inequality between what maybe the founding group is doing and, and new folks later on would be doing, or the amount of effort they kind of put in? Is there, have you thought about ways to like make that equal or could that create tensions or um, other ways that the founding group will be, should expect credit or, or even compensation or time later or, or something in the future to, to kind of recognize what's been done in the, in the initial time period? That's a good question. And um, in our bylaws, we have specifically designated who is a founding member and who is not, but that does not typically come with any benefits and in our bylaws it doesn't come with any benefits um i see personally i see a worker cooperative as putting in effort no matter what time you joined um i realized that as someone who has been part of pvd flowers since 2022 there may be more work that i did putting in hours to make the bylaws or planning events but the reason why we're doing all of this work right now is so that we can get other people involved. And um, I would argue that as organizers and activists, it's kind of our responsibility as people who wanted to really, really get involved with PVD Flowers to open the door to people who may not have this as a, for example, this is what I'm thinking of for the next five years of my life. Someone who was just hearing about PVD Flowers may not have that same kind of outlook. And as someone who put in all that effort to get this started, I wanna shine light on why I believe this works and why I think that person can get involved with PVD Flowers and be a meaningful part of it. So I don't have that mindset, but also coming from the perspective as an organizer and as an activist i know that dealing with people is always going to be tough people will always have their own emotions they will feel like they did more than the other and that can be really hard to balance but i just want to bring it back to the idea of a co-op 
being democratically run, being part of everyone's responsibility, everyone's benefit and everyone's risk. When we have that mindset where we're all responsible for what we're doing and everything that happens in the business reflects on us, um, I think that no matter the effort that one puts in, that effort is gonna be reflected on that person. Um, I feel like if someone, well, in writing, if someone works more hours in a co-op, they're gonna see more benefit just monetarily. And when someone puts more effort into something that they're passionate about, I think you just get more, more out of it morally and more out of it as a person. So I'm not too worried about that, Eric, though I think it's a really good point. And it's something I just kind of want to keep an eye out for as an organizer and as a member of PVD Flowers. So thank you. We have precisely one minute. Quick. Real quick. Real quick. Uh, yes. First of all, what a nice place to hang out. You guys. Usually, you know, with me, somebody's going to die for me to be around this many key brilliance. <laughs> so, oh, see, this is to you. And this yeah. is you know, to go to you know, organize. This is more common than anything, but it's still you know, this this new way of organizing. I was kind of wanting to jump off from where you were talking about things things changing. One of the things that come up is the language of organizing, the things that we say when we organize. Here's one of them. Like here you know, we came up like okay, black folks, Latinos, all right? I don't know how many times I look over it, and that Latino is black. You know what I mean? So I you know the thing is how many we get that guy to understand that we're in the same, you know, the same plight. Uh, we're having the same, you know, we're having the same uh, issue. We were talking about this earlier, remember, we were talking about differences, mm -hmm. you know? And this goes all the way down the line because, you know, especially now with, uh, you know, with science the way it is and stuff, we start poking around your 23 and me, you know, you know, people right. might be getting upset mm -hmm. about what they find in their little genetic closet. So, mm -hmm. I want to know about, you know, how you feel about that, how we need to change that, uh, you know, that language so that it, you know, so that it is more encompassing. And you have about 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, as organizers, the language definitely needs to be changed. All right. You know, the issues are far more complex. So, you know, our, our terminology needs to equal what the, uh, the issues are. And, you know, what as we talk about the issues of race, that, you know, it is, that's a complicated sort of discussion, but it's a discussion that must be had. Thank you so much. Please, thanks to both of our presenters.